Simon, I love science, I love philosophy, but some of my scientific friends tell me the only purpose of a good philosopher is to keep all those other philosophers away from science. <laughs> That's very good. I hadn't heard that before. Um, yes, a lot of what we do is firefighting. Um, but of course, it's not only other philosophers. It's scientists' own thoughts about their discipline uh, and about its importance or about the way it should be conducted or about what they're doing. Um, because I think uh, philosophy isn't the preserve of a professional cadre, a professional elite called philosophers. It's something that reflective people get to anyhow. Mm. Um, so sure, perhaps some of what we do is just firefight. We try and put down bad philosophy. <laughs> but the bad philosophy doesn't always just emanate from us. Well, the argument on the mm. other side that I hear mm. from philosophers mm. is that when scientists uh, give their opinion about why philosophy is worthless, mm. that is a philosophy. Yes. And so they are practicing philosophy without knowing it. Yes, and that is absolutely correct. <laughs> uh, if you say any activity is worthless, you're venturing a, a, a certainly an evaluative claim. And you better know what the activity is and why people do it and what its rewards or pains or penalties are, costs and benefits. Uh, and I think a lot of people who say philosophy, no, that's not for me, yeah. have no idea what they're talking about. So that's a, that's a pity. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start at first principles. Sure. Why philosophy of science? Well, um, as soon as you've got a science, you've got a description of the world in scientific terms, you've got an alleged explanation of some phenomenon which a scientist gives you, uh, you're going to start worrying about the terms of the explanation and whether it really is an explanation. Let's take, for example, Newton's theory of gravitation. When Newton published that in 1690, quite a lot of other scientists were um, you know, disappointed, funnily enough, Hmm. Um, they thought, that, you know, it's now regarded as, you know, one of the pinnacles of science. Um, but they thought they wanted to know what gravity was. And Newton apparently didn't tell them what it was. He just told them what it did. <laughs> um, so what is the gravitational field? Um, you know, now, of course, that may have been a scientific question, which remained unanswered at least till the 20th and possibly the 21st century with the hmm. Higgs boson. Um, but it was a, a question about how much the explanation had achieved and what was left to be achieved. Mm. And um, Hume came along, the philosopher, did some philosophy of science, and said that actually the kind of thing Newton did was the only kind of thing the human mind could ever do. So that was a claim about the, the scope and limits of science. Um, and that's a, a claim which needs evaluating. It needs looking at in its own mm. Right. Well, this is very important, mm. uh, the, the, the scope and limits of science. Sure. It's a very important yeah. point. Yeah. And so how can we uh, descend deeper into that? I think it's probably good to go back to the 17th century before Newton. Um, there was a rationalist ideal. The ideal was that um, if only we could see the world properly, we'd mm -hmm. see why things must be mm -hmm. as they are. We'd have, as it were, a kind of math, just as we think that two plus two must be four, that's straightforward. So we'd see that gravity must work in the way it does, that bodies must uh, attract each other with a force inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, and so on. That rationalist ideal was, took a knock from Newton, because Newton just said, this is how it is. Why it must be like this, that's up to God, we don't know. Uh, and. Uh, and that's what Hume said was the, the limit. We would never, we would never manage to achieve the rationalist ideal. We'd never see why things must be how they actually turn out to be. Mm -hmm. So science was always going to be empirical. It was never going to be, as it were, mathematical. It was never going to be a priori, as the jargon is. That is something you could just excogitate. Mm -hmm. uh, it always had to be um, basically subservient to how things actually fall out. That argument is still in play today. Oh, yes, very much so. Um, people would love a kind of theory of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's often promoted as an ideal. Um, now, if Hume's right, you can't have a theory of everything because your theory will eventually have to depend on unargued premises, unargued starting points, um, bare happenstance. It won't be like mathematics. So what are the practical implications of philosophy of science for some of the frontier areas of science right. and uh, understanding the cosmos, understanding the human mind, these core right. 
areas that we see as the frontier of, of human sure, exploration? Sure. Well, of course, I mean, the thing that gets everybody worried is the so-called cosmological argument, the argument about um, how, why is there something and not nothing? How do we explain the existence of the cosmos? Uh, now, I would argue that there's a, actually a concealed, as it, as it were, a catch in that question. Um, when you want an explanation, um, you're wanting a starting point. You're wanting something behind whatever it is you're explaining. Now, if you ask why there's something and not nothing, uh, you, as it were, cut off your own possibility of a starting point. There's no possibility of giving yourself a premise or a fact or a state of affairs uh, from which you can explain the arrival of something. Because nothing gives you no purchase. It gives you nothing to hold on to. <laughs> if it's a real nothing. Uh, if it's a real nothing, exactly. <laughs> so what people do when they ask that question is they surreptitiously start imagining something. They might imagine the hand of God, you know, the finger pointing from the sky. They, they might imagine a force field, or they might imagine uh, something. Now, a good um, response to that might be that of, for example, the physicist Stephen Hawking, who says that the question con does conceal a mistake. The mistake is that of supposing that there's time before the cosmos as we have it. Uh, time in which there was nothing. Time in which, as it were, events perhaps were somehow shimmering on and about to <laughs> go bang. Um, that's the mistake Hawking thinks. He thinks it's like asking what's south of the South Pole, uh, asking what happened before the, the arrival of the cosmos as we mm. have it. Um, the cosmos as we have it determines time, um, and that means there's no time before it's, before it started. Mm. Now, there's a big question about whether that's satisfactory, because if we think of the Big Bang as an event, I think it's probably part of the structure of our minds that we're going to think of it as an event in mm. time. And therefore, there was a before. Um, mm. Therefore, there is a question about uh, what brought it about. Um, Kant thought that that was a, an imperative of thought. Um, it, was, um, it wasn't, as it were, necessarily true, but it was the way we were bound to think about these things which means that the puzzle will never go away. There'll never be a point where we're relaxed. So please array the field, the mm. philosophy of science. H mm. How can we begin to understand its scope? Right. Well, I think there are two ways of doing this. One is to think of philosophy of science in general, and the other is to think of the philosophy of particular sciences, like physics or biology. Or Mathematics. The, oh, yeah, exactly. Um, in general, I think there's some topics which, as it were, affect every science. Like, for example, what's a law of nature? Is it even a good category to work with? Mm. Um, certainly, classically, um, you know, everybody that learns that there are laws of nature and some of them have names. And uh, it's very difficult to understand what is a law of nature. It's got a sort of shadowy existence. Uh, what does it do? Does it connect? What does it connect? Would it... Could you have a universe in which uh, there's nothing except laws of nature, kind of antecedent structure, waiting to structure mm. everything that happens? Mm. 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 Uh, and if so, what, what, what kind of thing would that be? Uh, so you've got a, a topic like what is the law of nature? Could a structure exist, uh, ready to structure whatever things there are into certain set patterns? Uh, and yet, what would it be like? What kind of authority would it have? What kind of oomph would it have? So the idea of a law of nature is itself very puzzling, and that affects any science, I think. Some would say that there are no laws of nature. There are regularities, but not laws. Good. That's right. And that would be an empiricist yeah. typical answer. Say, well, you, you don't really explain things by citing laws. What you do is you sum things up by <laughs> citing laws. Right, right. Um, and that, of course, was the view of David Hume. Um, he said very memorably that the most perfect philosophy of the natural kind, by which he meant science, only staves off our ignorance a little longer. A uh, great phrase. Mm. And what he had in mind was all you'll ever do is describe happenstance. You just describe how things fell, fall out. Uh, but the idea that you've got an explanation, uh, that's a rather elusive idea. So that's general philosophy of science. But then, of course, the particular sciences which raise particular problems. So to give two examples from contemporary discussion, um, the, the philosophy of physics, uh, there's a big issue about the nature of time. Uh, do we live in a universe 
of past, present and future in which there's change in time. Does time flow? Does time have a direction? Uh, and then there are philosophers who say, well, maybe there's no such thing as time. We live in a block universe mm -hmm. and the appearance of time is simply an appearance due to the contingencies of our own lives or our own minds. And that's a very live topic yeah. in physics and in the philosophy of physics. In philosophy of biology, um, there's a really live topic about how to understand a Darwinian population and what evolution in populations requires. So some biologists, Richard Dawkins is an example, uh, thinks it requires a, a, a carrier, a replicator, something that exists through change and goes on through generations. Other biologists think that's completely unnecessary and it's uh, putting a uh, putting a restriction on the nature of biological processes which we shouldn't observe. Now those are philosophical questions about the logic or structure that the scientific theory ought to take. They're not the preserve of professional philosophers. Scientists can raise those questions and they may be able to solve them, mm. in which case well and good. But the questions don't go away. It doesn't matter whether we call them uh, scientific or philosophical as long as we recognize them. Sure, scientists would say that those are scientific questions, they're not philosophical questions, mm -hmm. and philosophy has no, uh, has no uh, need to come into our area because mm -hmm. we have a discipline, a way of thinking, a methodology of experimentation, testing, yeah. replication sure. That, sure. Uh, that can solve these mm -hmm. problems, and mm -hmm. philosophy can't help us. But I, th I think that, uh, I mean, that, that's a perfectly understandable attitude. And of course, nobody likes somebody else horning in on their discipline and telling, telling them how to do it. But it's not so much a question of doing that as a question of answering questions which the scientists themselves will find themselves answering, uh, or asking rather. Uh, and it's not clear that there are scientific techniques which themselves solve the problems about how the science needs to proceed or what the logic mm. of the mm. explanation ought to be. So, for example, to take the case of time, uh, it's not clear that there's an experiment which is going to settle the issue between mm. uh, whether we should think of time as a river flowing or whether we should think of the universe as, in essence, timeless. Uh, that's a really difficult philosophical problem. Let me go back to the general philosophy of science and to the fundamental distinction on law, mm. on whether laws sure. are existing out there in reality right. or a construct that we put as a name to regularities that we Find continue to see. Yes. Uh, that, that's certainly a philosophical distinction, but is that a, 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 uh, a distinction without a difference? Good. Um, it's certainly a distinction in the way we think, um, but whether it's a distinction that actually filters through into practice, uh, I suppose is more, more iffy, because you might find two physicists or two scientists um, doing the same experiments, believing the same theories, systematizing their worlds in the same way, one of whom has one <laughs> philosophy right. and the other of whom has the other. Right, right. I think that's right, but you might find that. On the other hand, I think it's very dangerous to imagine that you can set limits to the difference that theor theoretical differences can make. Your ideas about what you're doing are going to filter through mostly to how you do it and what you think the significance of your results are and where you think perhaps uh, investigation stops. You may be satisfied with an explanation at a point at which a different scientist might say, no, we've, we've still got to get to the bottom of this. So your idea... So that's an important point, mm. and, and that would be a, uh, an opening for a philosopher of science to adjudicate. In principle, yes, or at least to add a voice to the conversation. Mm. Um, I think what you find is that the, uh, the deepest scientists, I wouldn't say the best, but the mm -hmm. deepest, um, raise these philosophical problems themselves. They see the, they they see what's done and what remains to be done, and they know where the puzzles remain, and the puzzles are genuine puzzles. <laughs>